a few weeks ago, or some weeks ago, probably a couple of months ago, and we talked about the Bible. We took a Sunday off just to say, let's go back and see how reliable this document is that we hold in our laps and hold in our hands. And so we established, did we not, that the Bible is the most reliable of all, of, of, of all literature in history. And today I'm going to read a passage of scripture that uh, documents also how relevant it is. And it's really one of the marks of authenticity for this book that it still speaks so clearly, so relevantly in, in the times and the days that we find ourselves. We are continuing our series on the book of Luke. If you guys can uh, put that uh, slide up there. We'll get to the Luke passage a little bit later in the message. We usually start with that Luke passage, but I'm going to start with a passage that was written by Paul. It was written to Timothy. He was a young pastor. He was one of Paul's understudies, one, one whom Paul had discipled. And he was just reminding him in light of the current of popular trend to stay true to the word, that word that we documented weeks ago as being so reliable. I'm just going to read this for you to you follow along if you like. It's from 2 Timothy, the third chapter. I'll begin reading at verse 14. But uh, I've written it on my sheet so it would be in a little bit bigger font so I could see it uh, for you. But you guys can go ahead and go to that next slide if you'd like. And I'm calling this message A Time for Truth because, uh, you know, I spend my weekdays on our college campuses in Texas and with college kids in Texas. And so I'm, I'm able to kind of keep up with what's going on in that context, maybe to a degree that you, you're not able and uh, some of the things that we're going to talk about this morning are real and true. And they're happening. It's thought that I encounter on a weekly basis, sometimes on a daily basis on our college campuses. And Paul addressed that to Timothy 2,000 years ago, relevant today. And I'm going to read this to you. 2 Timothy 3, beginning verse 14. But as for you, Timothy, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of. He names two sources. Because of those you know from whom you've learned, reliable sources, people who were trustworthy, verse 15, and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, that source of truth that is uh, undeniable, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. And then he makes that statement that we're also familiar with. All Scripture is God breathed or inspired by God and is useful for teaching it's a source of truth isn't it for rebuking for correcting and for training in righteousness morality to God for that which is moral that which is right so that the servant of God Timothy may be thoroughly equipped for every good work and skip down to chapter 4 beginning verse 2 Again, these are words to a young preacher. Preach the word, that source that is reliable, you know, source of truth. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, encourage. And these next two words are really important. With great patience and careful instruction, respectfully. Verse 3, for the time will come. And the time is now. This is written 2,000 years ago. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine, with truth. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers who say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from truth and turn aside to myths. But you, keep your head. In all situations, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, discharging the duties of your ministry. Well, that time has come, has it not? And this morning I would like to talk about, it's really a, a tsunami trend in uh, our culture today, and it's called relativism. And relativism is a, really a product of humanism. Humanism is approaching the world as though we were the center. And the product of that then is relativism. If I'm the center of the universe, 
then whatever I come up with can be true. Whatever I come up with is right. That is called relativism. And we have a two and a half minute section of a video that uh, Bruce has all queued up and ready to go there. Bruce, if you can go ahead and show that, just so that you'll take my word for it. This is what I hear Good every for you. Day. Okay. Like, <laughs> yeah. Nice to meet you. I'll be like, what? <laughs> really? I don't have a problem with it. I'd ask you how you came to that conclusion. If I told you that I was Chinese, what would your response be? I mean, I might be a little surprised, but I would say, good for you. Like, yeah, be who you are. (laughs) I would maybe think you had some Chinese ancestor. I would ask you how you similarly came to that conclusion and why you came to that conclusion. Um, I would have a lot of questions just because on the outside, I would assume that you're a white man. If I told you that I was seven years old, what would your response be? Um, I wouldn't believe that immediately. Uh, I probably wouldn't believe it, but I mean, I it wouldn't really bother me that much to go out of my way and tell you no, you're wrong. I'd just be like, oh, okay, he wants to say he's seven years old. If you feel seven at heart, then, <laughs> then so be it. Yeah, good for you. <laughs> so if I wanted to enroll in a first grade class, do you think I should be allowed to? Uh, probably not, I guess. I mean, unless you haven't completed first grade up to this point and for some reason need to do that now. If that's where you feel, like, mentally you should be, then I feel like there are communities that would accept you for that. I would say so long as you're not hindering society and you're not causing harm to other people, I feel like that should be an okay thing. If I told you I'm six feet, five inches, what would you say? That I would question. Why? <laughs> because you're not. <laughs> no, I don't think you're 6'5". If you truly believed you're 6'5", I don't think it's harmful. I think it's fine if you believe that. It doesn't matter to me if you think you're taller than you are. <laughs> so you'd be willing to tell me I'm wrong? I wouldn't tell you you're wrong. No, but I say that um, I don't think that you are. I feel like that's not my place as like another human to say someone is wrong or to draw lines or boundaries. No, I mean, I wouldn't just go like, oh, you're wrong, like, that's wrong to believe in it, because, I mean, again, it doesn't really bother me what you want to think about your height or anything. So, I can be a Chinese woman. You... (laughs) Um, sure. But I can't be a six-foot-five Chinese woman. Yes. (laughs) Does that surprise you? That is the atmosphere on our college campuses today. That was at the University of Washington. But you would hear the same things on our college campuses in Texas. It's called relativism. And I'll define it a few times, okay? It is the doctrine that teaches that there are no absolute truths or moral standards. That it's all up to us. It's all up to you. The doctrine that knowledge, truth, and morality exists in relation to culture, to society, or historical context, and they are not absolute. Truth and morality are a matter of personal or public opinion. We can just come up with it, and that's what it will be. Now, this is not really new. It, it is making some real headway the last 10 or so years, especially in our country. It, it has roots all the way back you know, B.C. times, Plato recognized relevance in his writings. Uh, early Hindu and Sikh uh, teachers in India embraced relativism. And in fact, uh, the Hindu faith is an exercise in relativism. They, they recognize multiple gods. You just pick the ones you want. Pick the ones you like. Or all of the ones you like. And uh, yet the strange thing about relativism is... You know, I can come up with whatever I want to say is true, or we as a culture can, but if you disagree with me, then you're being intolerant. And you are just being a bigot. And that's where it runs. I was on a campus at A&M in uh, uh, Commerce last semester. That's up northeast of Dallas. And, uh, you know, it's a conservative part of the state. We're in a conservative part of the country. And we were just walking to people, initiating conversation, sharing our faith. And uh, walked up to a lady who identified herself as a Hindu. And she said, she just, she crossed her arms. She said, I am offended 
at what you're doing. What right do you have to tell me or any other student what you think is true? Relativism. It's alive and well in our culture today. In fact, we're going to look at a few examples. So, Bruce, be ready. We're going to go through these pretty quickly. And uh, you, you've probably heard references to each of these, but when you put them all together, you begin to see the traction that relativism is getting in our culture today. First of all, you can be whoever you be. You can be whatever you say you are. Bruce Jenner. I have a picture there. Or how about this? Jenna Takova was born a boy has been receiving hormone therapy since the age of 14 and then surgery in 2010 and he will be allowed to compete in Canada's Miss Universe pageant as long as the culture recognizes him as a girl this June an Alaska boy who self-identifies as a girl competed in the state's female track and field finals and won all state honors right there Last Sunday night, Del Rio Television, there was a program about, uh, uh, about young girls who uh, self-identified as boys and were ongoing hormone treatments and then surgeries and working out in gyms and uh, changing their identity. Get this. There's a Canadian, father of seven, married, now identifies as a six-year-old boy. I've saved you from his picture. And he says this, I can't deny that I was married. I can't deny that I have children. But I've moved forward now, and I've gone back to being a child. I don't want to be an adult right now. This is true. Or get, there's a Norwegian woman. Go ahead and show the picture, Bruce. There's a Norwegian woman who calls herself Nano, and she believes that she was born a cat. Mm. She refuses to talk. She goes around in the house on all fours and purrs and meows. That's relativism, guys. And culture would say, good for Nano. If that's what Nano believes, and who am I to tell Nano she's wrong? Truth is relative. Relative to who Nano wants to be and who those around her in society may agree. And we have no place to correct her relativism. But seriously, the ser there's a real serious side of this. All of these folks I've just mentioned are made by God in His image, just like you and me. And so... Though some of the statements and positions they've made are tragic and laughable, their cases are very serious. And to treat them with respect, because they are made by God in His own image, and they're that unique part of our society that is made to relate to Him. And so it is becoming to us to relate to them with dignity, with respect, Though we're going to look at a slide in a little while. Respect doesn't mean that we all have to agree. That we can disagree with one another. We can do so respectfully. That's what Paul told Timothy to do. In light of relativism, embrace people with patience and with dignity. I personally would welcome an opportunity to have a personal visit with any of these people whose pictures we just said. And... Uh, try my best to explain to them that uh, as a child of God, that my love for them is intact, and his love for them is intact, and uh, we care for them. So, in the, so the conclusion of all this, in the year 2016, it is now culturally permissible to believe you're the opposite sex, or a father can become a toddler, or a person can even become a cat. Relativism. Well, what are the moral implications of relativism and this is this really gets serious as if those last cases were not uh, remember relativism doesn't only say that truth depends on what I decide it is it also says that morality that which is right and wrong is up for me to decide or for us as a culture to decide let's look at a few instances you know what right do you have to tell me what's right or wrong 
We've probably heard somebody say that, have we not? Relativism, found home right here, Del Rio, Texas. Or this, be true to yourself. Well, whatever you say, whatever's right for you, is right for you, that's relativism. It says that each has the liberty to determine what's true and morally acceptable by himself, for himself, relativism. So we get to decide what's right and wrong. And look how badly this can go awry, okay? Let's talk about the one moral issue, murder, okay? Let's see, killing the unborn in a womb. It's a matter of choice in society today. Genocide. Remember Hitler? He decided personally and led a whole group of people to embrace the extinction, the attempted extinction of a whole uh, race of the people who lived in Germany at the time. Euthanasia. Killing those who have terminal diseases, often elderly, but even a child who may have a debilitating terminal disease. Euthanasia. It's uh, legal today to do that. In the Netherlands, in Belgium, Ireland, Colombia, and Luxembourg. You can do that. A family can come to decide for another individual, well, he is terminally ill, he has cancer, let's go ahead and end it now. And it's legal to do so in those countries. Assisted suicide. Somebody just decides, for whatever circumstances, they don't want to continue to live, and so they hire the assistance of a physician to do that. It is legal today in Switzerland, Germany, Japan, Albania, Canada, and five U.S. states. You can do that today. Jihad, the killing of the infidel. Or the apostate, one who would convert from Islam to any other faith or just out of, of Islam to no faith. Under Sharia law, legal to kill that person. Honor killings, tragic, tragic. The Islamic practice is often associated with the Asian con continent when, when a, a young lady would go against the beliefs or the values of her family, that it's considered honorable to that family to kill her. And these are not isolated cases. The UN estimates that 5,000 honor killings have happened this year already. One in ten Asians affirm the practice of honor killings. So the consequences of relativism are huge. This is not a moot issue. Well, let's go to one more subject. How about the definition of marriage? That's a moral issue, is it not? Okay. You know, in the Bible, it says that marriage is the union of a man and a woman for what? For life, right? But we've seen all the attempts, you know, to redefine that. Well, it can be a husband and a husband, a union of a, 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 a wife and a wife. I saw last night on the news in San Antonio, uh, CPS, Child Protective Services, make, was making appeal for foster homes. They say, we have children uh, sleeping on the floors in our offices and in hotel rooms because we don't have enough foster families. And so all families are welcome. It can be a husband and a wife. It can be a husband and a husband or a wife and a wife. We will let any of you foster these children. And then polygamy. Yeah. You know, it's interesting to me that, you know, polygamy, I've, maybe I'm just sheltered, but I've known cases where, you know, and, Polygamy, a man would have several wives. I've never heard of a woman having several husbands. Does anybody catch me up on that? But you know what? In relativism, that's okay. That would be okay too. Relativism. So the conclusion in the year 2016 is now culturally permissible to believe that murder is okay and marriage is exactly whatever you feel like you want it to be. But, we have this statement. Go ahead, Bruce, with the next slide. A lie doesn't become truth. And wrong doesn't become right. And evil doesn't become good just because it's accepted by society. That's why Paul said what he did to Timothy. 
go back to the source of truth because truth is a real thing and it's not up for us to decide. Well, let's see what God feels then about relativism. <clears throat> Read a verse from Isaiah chapter 5. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness over light or light over darkness, who put bitter for sweet or sweet for bitter. Such people have rejected the law, that which is true, that which is absolute, of the Lord of hosts, and have despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. Those issues are not up to us to determine. They were determined by the creator of the universe before time began. That which is true is true. In whatever cultural context, in whatever chronological context, regardless of what you and I may feel like it is our freedom to exercise our opinion. The Bible says the truth is absolute. There does exist a moral standard to which all people of every culture will be held accountable. To Revelation 20, verse 11 and 12. I like what Rick Warren said about this in response. Go ahead and put the next frame up there if you would, Bruce. Our culture then has accepted these two huge lies. We've seen evidences of it this week in the news. The first is if you dislike someone's lifestyle, then you must fear or hate them. Hmm. The second is that to love someone means that you have to agree with everything they believe or do, and both are nonsense. Yeah. You don't have to compromise convictions, that which is true, in order to be compassionate. Thank you, Rick, for saying that. Okay, let's go. We've talked about you know, some social implications, some moral implications. Let's go to theological implications, and we're cl getting closer to our section from which really this whole idea was born uh, from the from the book, book of Luke. I have a really, really smart friend. He's very well read, very highly educated. I care a lot about him. But he said this one day in one of our conversations. Our conversations have gone on for a number of years now. He said, Robert, this is the way I did it. We were talking theology. He said, I started down here. And then I built my idea of, of who God is for myself. As opposed to the Christians who would say that God was up here and reveals himself to mankind. So he took the position and saw that as superior. I made God who I wanted him to be. As opposed to the God who self-discloses, self-reveals himself. And so you see, he would be one who would agree with Oprah Winfrey. All paths lead to God. It just takes a different route. Well, that would counter what any serious, even component of the uh, Muslim faith. No imam would ever tell you that. No Jew would ever tell you that. No devout Buddhist would ever tell you that. No devout Christian would say, all ways are good ways. And they all end up in the right place. It's only those who've taken a position outside of even those religious traditions who would say that always go. So theological imp implications. Uh, let's go ahead to that next uh, slide, if we would, Bruce. You see, God is not who we get to make, make him up to be. He's not. Is he, he's who he says he is. And starting in the Old Testament way long ago, next slide, Bruce. When Moses, having received the Ten Commandments, God said, take him to the people. He, he said, uh, who should I say sent me? You know, who, who should I say I got these from? And this was God's answer. I am. Tell them the I am sent you. And the, those I am statements are God's statement for who he is. You know, just think about it in these terms. You know, I am who I am. I, I know who my parents were. I know where I was born. I know when I was born, where I grew up, the things I've done in life. And so those things are a matter of record. Those things are a matter of fact. Now, for you to believe that God would be treated differently even from me and that you get to come up with your own ideas of me, 
You get to come up with your name for me. You get to come up with your idea of where I was born and when, who my parents were, the things that I've done, what I think and feel and believe. That's how absurd it is for us to think that we can do that with God. No less absurd than that you could do that with me or that I could do that with you. You know, I am who I am and the degree to which I will reveal to you who I am is the degree to which you will know who I am. (laughs) Well, that's what God was saying to Moses. I am. And I am revealing myself to you and the people. And who I am is who I am. And so you don't get to make up who I am. Let's look at a few instances. Some of these are really popular. Um, uh, did I already say that, that, that the I am word is God's fav- favorite name for himself? appears 43 times in the Old Testament and it's continued and repeated in the New Testament but one of the places that you've heard it you've heard it many times is as if is Psalm 4610 go ahead and put that slide up there be still and know that I am God you know he is who he is and he reveals himself to us relativism has no place to exercise this this creation of an imaginary friend that one may choose to call God. Okay, now we're going to Luke. (laughs) This is the Luke passage that prompted this whole message. So Bruce, if you can go ahead and go to the text there. I put it on two different screens to keep the font a little bit bigger. But uh, this is a conversation that Jesus had with the disciples, and it went like this. Once when Jesus was praying in private, his disciples were with them, and he asked them, as if there was even an exercise of relativism going on in, you know, the first century. Who the crowd say that I am? And they replied, well, some say John the Baptist. See, people were doing this. Others say Elijah, and still others. One of the prophets from long ago who's come back to life. And then Jesus said, what, what about you? And what do you think? Who do you say I am? And Peter answered, God's Messiah. And then Jesus went on to say, you got it. And flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you. You didn't come up with this on your own. And society didn't tell you this. But this was revealed to you, revealed to you by my Father in heaven. Truth is revealed. It's not imagined. Eight days later, go to the next slide is as if the conversation picked back up again. And Jesus said he took Peter and James and John with him up to a mountainside to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face changed. And his clothing became bright as a flash of lightning. Picture all of that taking place. Two men, Moses and Elijah, showed up, appeared in glorious splendor, talking with Jesus. They said, spoke about his departure which was about to bring fulfillment at Jerusalem and Peter's companions were very sleepy I bet they woke up says they did but when they became fully awake they saw his glory and the two men sang with him as the men were leaving Jesus Peter said master it is good for us to be here let us put up three shelters one for you one for Moses one for Elijah he didn't know what he was saying and uh, while he was speaking a cloud appeared revelation and covered them. And they were afraid as they entered the cloud. And a voice came from the cloud. This is God revealing himself. This is my son whom I've chosen. Listen to him. See, God's not who we, get to, who we just decide he is. And Jesus isn't who we just decide who he is. You know, he is who he is. Truth is revealed. Let's look at a few of the popular passages in the New Testament. You've heard defining clearly. You know, I've even heard this on college campuses. Well, you know, Jesus never did really say he was the Messiah. Beg to differ. He really did. You read that on a website. I, I can show you in the Bible where he did. How about this, John fourteen six? Jesus, using that same name that God used for himself, I am referencing God. I am the way, the truth, the life. 
No man comes to the Father but by me. I am the only way. This is not a relative thing. There are no other ways. I am. Uh, First Timothy 2, 5. Uh, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men. The man, Christ Jesus. That's not up for us to come up with. Truth is truth. This is not relative. It's not a matter of opinion, either public or mine. Jesus said, I am the only way. And Paul affirmed it. There's one God, one mediator. Not all these other ways lead to God. Jump all the way back to Revelation 1 8. You can put that next slide back up there on there, Bruce, again. Uh, I am. There's that word again, that name again, God's name. The Alpha and the Omega, which means, of course, the beginning and the end, and the end, saith the Lord, the one who is and the one who is to come, the Almighty. Two weeks ago, this message was already cooking in my mind. Remember, this was supposed to be last Sunday's and then the events in Dallas Thursday night a week ago. You know, we changed what we did last Sunday and honored our law enforcement guys. Thank you all for helping us do all that. And uh, But I was preparing for this and I read this. It's in a devotional book, like many of you use in your own devotional reading, by Oz Hillman. He said this, relevant. Son, you live in a culture that is seeking to destroy my existence and my relevance the enemy of your soul seeks to work through the minds of men public opinion humanism is the god of your day relativism is the byproduct the enemy seeks to capture minds and secularize your heart and here's the guard against it meditate on my word. Let's stay close to the source of truth. It doesn't change. It's indisputable from the most reliable book in all of the world's literature, all of history. Meditate on my word, son, so your mind is renewed, made new again, with, in compliance with truth daily. And then he ends with that, those two words. I am the same yesterday, today, and forever. Well, I didn't do all this just to make us mad. <laughs> and uh, it really was, I was reading through Luke and saying, Lord, which passage should I focus on and look at? And I thought it very interesting that Jesus was aware that people were coming up with ideas about who he was. Instead of waiting for that to be revealed to them as truth. They were exercising their privilege, their right, and coming up with their own ideas. He was aware of that. But then he asked the guys, who do you say that I am? The ones who've been close to the source, the ones to whom he had been revealing himself, and Peter's the one who said it, and he said for the rest of them, you're the Messiah. Yeah. Truth is real. Even in a jury, you know, their job is not to come up with a version of what may or may not have happened. Their job is to come up with what did happen, what is true. And in each of us, Paul's calling all of us to do the same thing. So what's, what's the way we do that? Stay close to the Word. And even our gathering in the mornings on Sundays like this, we're affirming because the rest of culture is out of step with a truth that is absolute. And it's applauding and calling heroes those who are exercising their right of relativism today. I'm not going to be mad at them. I'm not going to go there. I'm going to try to love them, stay true to that which is true. And that's why I work with college students during the week yeah pray for me as I do okay and those with whom I do that and uh, that we will be able to counter the tsunami of public opinion okay pray with me okay and we'll finish with this, this way uh, worship team if you'll come this way Lord thank you that we don't have this terrible burden of coming up from our imagination 
with a picture of who you may be that that's not up to us we don't have that burden thank you for graciously revealing yourself to us thank you for giving us this source which we call your word that we get to go to your source to see who you are and Lord as we've done that thank you that we've encountered you as full of grace and mercy and forgiving and welcoming and creating our lives new and giving us people like the people in this room to live life with. So Lord, I thank you. I thank you that you are true and that truth is true and that we are so blessed to know you as you truly are. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.